Yeah, there's no point. Well, I think we celebrate too much these days as well. <laughs> I mean, everything seems to be a cause for bloody celebration, doesn't it? If you have too much of anything, it loses the value. <laughs> Welcome to Season 2, Episode 14 of 30 Minute Call. Thanks to the Canberra Theatre Centre and proudly produced on the lands of the Ngunnawal Nation. We pass our love and respect onto the Ngunnawal people and their elders. Yarn and hello. Joe Gleeson here and uh, in this episode we are joined by Jonathan Biggins. Of course, a regular face at the Canberra Theatre Centre through shows like The Wharf Review and The Gospel According to Paul and plenty others that he's been involved in over the years. Uh, We talk parenting. We talk political correctness. We even talk self-improvement. So let's get into it. Jonathan Biggins, this is your 30-minute call. Twenty twenty has been uh, a big year for all of us. My guest today is absolutely no exception to that. He's had a, a few milestones pop up this year, which we will get to all in good time. Here he is, writer, actor, director, and hopefully willing podcast guest ladies and gentlemen jonathan biggins hello hello there mate uh what have we caught you in the middle of you're in canberra at the moment yes we're in canberra with the walk review um a slightly delayed uh production of the 2020 walk review and uh we've just started we're here for three weeks this mm. year because of um covert restrictions obviously the audience numbers are limited so we're here for a, a long haul you have to work even uh, harder yeah, yeah. Well, um, yeah. Well, better than not working at all, I suppose. That's true. It's been most of the year. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah, yeah. Um, I was supposed to see the show earlier in the week, but I got some uh, some uh, salmon related food poisoning, which I'm going to describe oh. as not fun. Um, so I I haven't been able to see the show yet, mate. How was how have the first couple of performances been? Uh, look, it's it, it's going well. I mean, we always enjoy being in Canberra. It always um, feels like our spiritual home. Mm. Uh, but I think audiences are enjoying it. I think people are enjoying just being out and, and yeah. being able to see something again. Yeah. Um, it's a bit weird having, having two-thirds of the house there. Yeah. Um, but it, you can't really see it. It, it. it looks like a full house, but uh, we, we can just sense oh, it's not quite what we're used to. Yeah. But uh, no, it's going well because, I mean, we only started the show last week. Yep. in Parramatta, so we're still finding its feet and uh, it always takes a little time to settle into the groove, but I think we're getting there uh, and in, uh, enjoying it, yeah. Yeah, great. Excellent. Um, many uh, Australians, I think, would know you through your comedy, but um, mm-hmm. it's not just sort of things like Wharf Review uh, and uh, things like that that you've done in the past. You've actually... Um, got involved in a bit of opera as well, uh, played roles in mm-hmm. operas like The Mikado. You've directed uh, Orpheus in the Underworld for Opera Australia. Yep. Did your love yep. of, of comedy come first or was it the opera that actually uh, came up? Um, well, I've always been you know, a singer. I was in the choir as a kid and, and I've always done musicals and things like that. Um, and I guess comedy, you just sort of fall into it because you, you, know, you, you tend to follow what you good at yeah. uh, or better at shall we say um but i've now i've done some straight serious acting i mean last year i did uh crap's last tape the beckett play which is uh, very bleak and yeah. um uh very sort of you know straight acting i did that and that was a lot of fun so i do do that but you tend to get i mean you know if, if that's the strength that's what people want um, and because it branched out into writing it as well and you you know create your own material uh, the review has taken up a big part of that. But, I mean, Office in the Underworld, that's a funny opera. And the Mikado, that's funny. Yeah. Um, but, no, I've enjoyed my time doing the operas. Um, but uh, I don't know how much of that's going to happen in the future. I think they've been one of the company's hardest hit by COVID. Uh, so we sort of wait to see yeah. how that will go. But um, I've done a few GNS and, and various things. And... I've always liked that sort of uh, musical theatre of any type. Mm. Um, so, yeah, but I guess uh, political satire is the one where I've been most employed or doing, you know, it led into something like the Gospel According to Paul. Yes. Which was the, the theatrical biography of Mr Keating, yeah. uh, which proved very popular and I think it's coming back to Canberra next year. Yes, um, I believe so. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. I mean, that was hit by the COVID as well. We were... Half, we're beginning our tour and we're at Glen Street in Sydney and then 
suddenly all the theatres shut down, so that was it. And yeah. We kind of got an inkling on that last map, May we had 125 no-shows. Oh, People wow. had bought tickets but didn't want to go and risk it, so we thought, oh, that's why it's going. Time to go. Uh, and then the next day they said anything, all theatres closed, so the whole tour was off. Wow. So hopefully it's going to happen in 2021. Yes. Oh, excellent. Mm. It must be nice when you get the opportunity because we see <clears throat> that quite often with people who are known as sort of being the, 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 the funny guy or the funny girl uh, get their chance to show off their, their, their skills in oh, some yeah. of those darker roles and really sink their teeth yeah. into them. It must be nice to, to show off that side of your, your acting repertoire yeah, as well. well. Yeah, it's the old, you know, the client who wants to play Hamlet. Um, yeah. But uh, now people, if they haven't seen you do it, uh, and it's also, you know, you can direct and write things that are slightly more serious. Mm. But I mean, I always think comedy is, is fairly serious. I also think comedy is much harder to do than... Um, uh, the straight acting, yes, uh, and yet it's always sort of you know slightly condescended to, in the same way that the film industry is lauded as being you know the most important thing, whereas more people will see the War for View than will probably see an Australian film yeah. on its first release. Um, but that's just a kind of there's a hierarchy of uh, things, and comedy is low on the on the hierarchy of what is considered you know to be good acting because mm. um, we always think of ourselves we're not comedians we're, we're comic actors and I, I think there's a difference and I think anyone who tries to do it realises it's not as um, simple as some people make out mm. um, When it comes to being an audience member Jonathan what styles of shows do you find yourself attracted to? Um, well I'm probably the worst audience member I very really, really <laughs> laugh out loud I <laughs> uh, and right. I'm probably hypercritical but I, anything that's theatrical, yeah, right. you know, I, I don't want to go to the theatre and watch, um, well, I don't want to watch TV at the theatre for a start, mm-hmm. it seems to be a growing trend, but anything that's just a bit larger than life, I mean, I think in these times, obviously, people are craving a bit of entertainment, a bit of escapism, um, I, yeah, it, it's hard, but I, I mean, I'll go and see anything, Yeah, right. um, but I, I do prefer... And it's nice to see big casts. Uh, I like seeing actors on stage, although that's increasingly difficult with um, the economics of it all. Yeah. Um, but, uh, yeah, anything that's well done uh, and is engaging, I'm, I'm quite happy to sit and watch. Um, I did say earlier that uh, you've had a few milestones in 2020. One of them is that your twin daughters turned 20 this year. Yes, I do. We're 21 in a couple of months. 21 in a couple of months. Yeah. That's, uh, that's yes. am- amazing. I've got I've got three of my own, but I could never imagine having uh, twins, you know, two little ones at the same time. That must have been uh, interesting also at the same time because Wharf Review took uh, it turned 20 this year. Around that time, you've got two newborns and into this, yeah. this new show. What was that time like well, for you? Well, they were born during the first performance first run. No way. Uh, the very first Wolf Review, yeah. Yeah, right. Uh, in February 2020. Uh, in February 2000. Um, and I remember because uh, my wife, she had um, preeclampsia, so we were oh. taking a hospital there right prematurely. Uh, yeah. Plus we are getting the house renovated. <laughs> it was all perfect. Oh my room. God. Um, and I remember being at the hospital thinking, oh, gee, I, can't, I don't have the... Um, stage manager's number. I had to ring the box office to tell them that I won't, might not be able to make it in for the <laughs> evening performance. She went in between the matinee and the evening. Um, but luckily, she sort of stabilised a bit and they were born a couple of days later. But uh, wow. all very, yes. Wow, so your daughter's really only ever known a world where uh, Wharf Review existed and, and um, you know, y- yeah. you're not... Uh, you're not the, the, the run-of-the-mill sort of dad that has that sort of, you know, standard sort of office job. Is it... It's, uh, is it... No. No, they were saying this the other day. I mean, they're actually coming down to Canberra to see the show next week. But yeah. um, they were saying the other day, they were, their friends saying, oh, wow, well, you're just going on tour. That must be good. And I said, no, not really. Yeah. <laughs> it just happens all the time and it's really boring. <laughs> <laughs> um, so, uh, yeah, they, they've grown up. I mean, it's a terrible... It is a difficult job to have with a family. It's very antisocial hours, yeah. particularly to work in long runs. And touring is difficult. For a couple of years, I, you know, obviously you can't tour. 
And when children are very small, you can take them with you. But when, as soon as they start school, that's yeah. over. How, so you, how did you deal with that? Well, with difficulty. Um, and just for some years, we just couldn't tour at all, or just very short ones. I mean, the review didn't used to tour quite as extensively as it does now. Mm. Um, so that would, that was a bit, but you know, bigger shows, I, I, I would have to say no to. Wow. Um, and and yeah, so and it takes its toll on on family life. Yeah. Um, particularly when, as I said, when working six nights a week and. Um, and they get up at, you know, they wake with the dawn. Yes. Uh, when they're small, or, you know, school and all that sort of stuff. But, you know, well, we've got through it. You got through it. It's a lot. You probably, complain. at the time, you're probably thinking, this is never going to end, this is going to go on forever. But, yeah. you know, it's, you're all, they're all grown up now. It's, it's wow. All over too quickly. Yeah. yeah. The Wharf Review, uh, 20 years on now. Uh, have you got? You must have some great memories, obviously, of all the different the different shows, the different sketches that you've done over the years. Is there any uh, particular sketches that do pop out for you that you sort of look back on fondly? Uh, look, it's hard. We're thinking about this, you know, uh, and you forget so many of them. Yeah, I bet. I mean, because it's an awful lot of shows. Because in the early years, I mean, the first year we did three in the first year. Yeah. Um, wow. But it, then it sort of settled down into doing one. But. Um, I mean, I've got a fondness for the French Revolution sketch okay. from, um, when was that? That was quite some time ago, and then we did it in the 2015 show, uh, which was filmed. Um, oh, great. And that, 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 that always is a bit of a favourite. Um, I think the Rod and Gillard Phantom of the Opera sketch, that was pretty good. Oh, yeah, brilliant. Um, uh, so, yeah, what else? Oh, the first Donald Trump. Then Donald Trump was funny. Yeah. Um, it was interesting. The, the year he got elected, we did a, you know, Donald Trump live at Mar-a-Lago with um, Boris Johnson and Putin and Angela Merkel yeah. and uh, Ivanka. And, and that was fun. And, and people laughed at him. You know, he could say virtually anything. And then over the years uh, of his presidency, it became less and less uh, return for the performer playing Trump. Uh, and last year, I mean, you know, you'd go out there and you'd just get virtually nothing. But now, now that he's lost, yeah. he's back to being a figure of fun. So this year, uh, he's back in the in the funny books. And when he, well, spoiler alert, when he's finally, you know, defeated, um, the audience are very enthusiastic. Yes, <laughs> happy to laugh at him again. Yeah, any- you, you can the license too. Yeah. Are there any sketches that you think back on, you know, when you first started, that you think, geez, we wouldn't be able to get away with that now? Oh, there's a lot of stuff that, yeah, yeah you, <laughs> you can't do, uh, which I find, you know, the, the whole debate about, I mean, I find it ridiculous that some people are saying it's political satire and you shouldn't offend people. Mm. Um, I think the idea is to offend everybody, but it's, it's kind of been decided by some mysterious committee that there are certain people you can offend and certain people you can't. Right. And it's loosely based on, you know, the truth to power argument and, you know, don't pick on the powerless or minorities. But you think, well, who decides who's powerless and who isn't? Um, how do you do sketches when you've got three white guys and a white woman about China? Um, in the past, you could just be Xi Jinping. You don't have to just being him you know you know there's nothing you're not um attacking the person you're attacking the political system but mm-hmm. that is considered now well, no, you're not allowed to do that um so there's there's quite a bit of that going on in fact someone had a, a great suggestion for a title for a review we should call it woke in fight <laughs> um <laughs> it's not bad but, <laughs> Because I think there's a real danger to it because you, you get to the point where, you know, you, you're self-censoring. Mm. And you also get to the point when a, a noisy little bunch on Twitter determine what's happening for everybody mm. uh, and also make fundamental mistakes. Like I think when the um, activists shut down Hedwig and the Angry Inch because the role was not being played by a transgender performer, even though it's not, the role is not about a trans person. And, and the authors actually came out and said, well, that's not what it's about. Anyone can play it. Yeah. But the Sydney Festival, fearing the backlash, pressured the producer to pull the production. Now, I think that's very, very dangerous, and that kind of smacks to me a bit of, you know, we've heard the terms degenerate art 
what is acceptable art and what is not acceptable. And where do we hear that? I wonder, hmm, Germany, 30s? Uh, so I think it's a very, very dangerous path you start going down when you decide, or when others decide what can and can't be said. Mm. Bearing that in mind, we've always been sensitive to, you know, what is acceptable, and we always believe that you know, nothing is off off limits as a subject of humour. Yeah. What is off limits is who you say it to, and and you have to judge your audience, and you have to, you know, what you can say to your friends in your lounge room, you may not be able to say um, in public simply because the public won't like it. Mm-hmm. Uh, and it won't it won't get a, a laugh. Um, so you you use that barometer to judge what is acceptable, but certainly no subject should be deemed off limits for a satire. Mm-hmm. I mean, I agree with Stephen Fry when he said no one has the right to not be offended, but uh, that doesn't seem to be the way anymore. Yeah. Uh, and we're all being super careful. And the other problem is, you know, as soon as you do that, and then people go, oh, you're just like Andrew Bolt. You think, oh, God, please don't call me that. Oh. Uh, so you've got to be careful. You, you know, it's a it's a, a tricky path to tread, but mm. I think um, the sort of new wowserism is becoming slightly threatening to a free and fair exchange of ideas. Yeah, yeah. I'm glad it's you trying to judge that barometer and not I. Jonathan, it sounds, <laughs> yeah, it's a tricky one. It sounds like a, a tough job. But I think, you know, we've, we've never really had any problems in the past. I mean, we've never had an audience really complain. I think, you know, the biggest complaint we got was when someone played, uh, in a review, someone played the stingray that killed Steve Irwin. Oh, right. Now, you know, they stormed out of the theatre over that in high dudgeon, even though the same review had sketches about the killing of Kurds by Saddam Hussein. Um, a whole thing about Australia's going into Afghanistan. Mm. And you think, well, if that's what's going to cause you outrage, yeah, um, you know, who can say? But but as I said, you know, it, it is supposed to be satirical. It's like fringe festivals when when the artistic director of the Melbourne Fringe Festival said, "This has to be a safe space for everybody." No, it doesn't. It's supposed to be a place of danger. That's the whole idea of the Fringe Festival. Mm. The whole idea of subversive art is that you make sort of people feel uncomfortable. Yeah. Um, it's supposed to challenge you. That, that, yeah, that's, it's supposed to challenge you. But, um, and if it says things... I mean, I'm, I'm the ambassador for the Newcastle Fringe Festival, mm-hmm. uh, and they, they have a policy, basically, that it's completely artist-driven. Yeah, right. Um, and they don't... They won't curate or they won't interfere... And they say that, you know, people tend to be fairly sensible and they trust the artist to make decisions um, about what what should be discussed and what should be done yeah. and said. And I, I think that's a healthy attitude. You're but a, it's not one that's prevalent at the moment. You, you are a, a newie boy originally from Newcastle. Yep. Um, so you yep. do have a, a bit to do with Newcastle still? You're involved yeah, in that community yeah. still? Yeah, yeah, just, um, we just did a play. My brother-in-law actually wrote a play about Peter Sellers, a one-man show, which we did oh, up great. there oh, like 20 years ago, 22 years ago. Oh, right. And he just sort of brought it back, so we just um, we did that. In fact, that opened the same night, I think, as the review did. So I was back up and forth, up and down the freeway, trying to get both shows opened. That yeah, wow. Week. <laughs> um, but that went very well, and hopefully that'll have a future life. Yeah, great. Oh, very good. <laughs> Mm. Um, you are busy, of course, with uh, you know, family and all these different shows that you've got going on, obviously in Newcastle mm. and Sydney and, and uh, touring, but you, you're a writer as well. You've written three books, uh, as it were, 700 Habits of Highly Ineffective People and the most mm. recent one, 700 Habits of Highly Ineffective Parents. How, mm. how many of this in this last title, how many of those ineffective habits do you just pull directly from yourself or is from this... Life. Oh, all of them. The yeah. funny thing about that, <laughs> the, the, the 700 Habits of Highly Ineffective People, mm. that went into a couple of editions. That sold really well. The, the parents one didn't sell quite so well. And the reason is that most modern parents are completely humorous <laughs> and think they're doing a marvellous job. <laughs> I mean, the whole rise of the helicopter parent. Yeah. And, and, and you know, I... I did a, a piece for the um, New South Wales Primary Principles. I was supposed to 
host their conference this year, but it was um, obviously cancelled due to COVID, but we did a piece for them. And the thing that they most liked about the year, the teachers, was not the parents not being allowed in school. <laughs> of course, yeah. Yeah, because the teachers were just allowed to get on with teaching the kids, which is what they know how to do, which parents don't know how to do, but they think they do. Yes. Um, so the, the highly ineffective habits of parents, no, that was met with many um, a snooty face. Because, really? I would have uh, thought that, uh, you know, oh, parents... Oh, no, I think... I think modern parents think they're the bloody... A, their children are the centre of the universe, mm -hmm. and they as parents are not far off that centre. Oh, wow. Um, when you think of how we were brought up, we were just uh, in the background of our parents' lives. Mm. Now, it's children... Well, you know what it's like. Yeah. Um, they bloody dominate everything. <laughs> uh, they and, do. <laughs> yeah, and, and it, it's quite extraordinary. And the number of... I don't know how anyone can teach children now with the parents being able to email them 24 hours a day and complain and whinge and, oh, mm. must be a nightmare. Um, so, yeah, that was a, a an interesting lesson in um, demographics. <laughs> <laughs> You're obviously um, you know, interested in uh, self-improvement and, and obviously uh, serving up a, a dose of humour along with it, but uh, mm. do, you, do you sort of listen to or, or, or read a lot of sort of self-improvement books or podcasts? Oh, no. No? no? No, no, not at all. I think the whole industry is a, a bunch of charlatans. In fact, that <laughs> book came out of... I used to do quite a bit of emceeing and, and I would do emceeing conferences yeah. and they have a lot of motivational speakers, as you know. Mm. Um, and some of them you thought, seriously? Like I used to do um, AMP conferences. So there'd be a bunch of, you know, financial planners and accountants sitting there. Yeah. And the most tenuous threads were drawn are those guys called the Afterburners or something. They were former F-111 pilots. Right. And they were trying to liken flying, you know, missions in Iraq at subsonic speeds with financial planning. <laughs> <laughs> It's a tenuous connection at best. Um, or they had the um, the guy who was the, uh, you know that Bob Dylan song, This Is The Story Of A Hurricane. Yeah. The champion boxer who was jailed yeah. incorrectly for murder. Yep. Uh, and they had him out. Oh, wow. And he, yeah, he was a great speaker, but he, he, he hadn't done his research and he thought A&P in America, they're, um, they're contract electricians. <laughs> Oh, no. So he kept referring to, you know, whether it's me locked up in solitary confinement or you as a contract electrician. Oh, and no, no one had the no one had the nerve to say, uh, we're actually financial <laughs> Um so I thought, yeah, and he's getting paid you know, twenty five grand or whatever for that and Well done. Tripped up at the first thing. But uh, no, so I wrote the book in response to it because I think I mean I think the self help industry is what is it's the snake oil of the twenty twenty first century, um, and again, but it's an interesting phenomenon why people think they they need it, mm. um, and and why so many people <laughs> um, are turning to it. And the other interesting thing is now that conspiracy theories are being sown and planted in the wellness industry, and and people who sort of you know go in for that a lot of that sort of self motivation and self improvement. And Apparently, they are more susceptible to believing conspiracy theories and spreading them, which is slightly alarming because most of the people are fairly intelligent and well educated, and they're not, you know, they're not stupid. Mm. But um, for, you know, the, the world we live in has uh, made it rough pickings for conspiracy theories. Yeah, bit of Pete Evans but action. I oh, put it. Pete Evans, <laughs> I mean, really. But you, but it's like. It's like, you know, religious dogma and pre-Reformation or medievalism or whatever. You, you cannot argue with the people because the logic doesn't enter into it. Yeah. yeah. Uh, if you have the faith, you have it. Yeah. It's like Trumpism. Yes. You can argue to your blue in the face and say that's not true, but they're just saying, well, that's because you're not reading the true, true facts. Yeah. So it's very, very difficult. And, and that's what, uh, you know, that's what they said during the Spanish Inquisition. So, um, you know, the more we move on, the more we stay the same. Mm. 
Mm. Um, there you go. <laughs> so uh, <laughs> the the other, I guess, milestone that popped up for you this year, mate, you turned the big six zero. Uh, oh, thanks for letting everyone know yeah, that. Yeah, sorry, mate. Um, <laughs> how, did, how did you celebrate? Did you have a big, big soiree? No, no. Well, no, you probably couldn't have, have really. Um, well, I'm planning to come. We just bought a new house, so we're okay. planning on eventually, you know, maybe having a house warming and a 60th. But oh, good. now that it's passed, I think I'll just let it quietly slip into the. In the distance of time, and, and why do we do that as adults? Why do we do it? We say, Oh, no, nah, don't worry, it's, ah, it's gone, don't worry about it now. It's no point, yeah, there's no point. <laughs> well, I think we celebrate too much these days as well. <laughs> I mean, everything seems to be a cause for body celebration, doesn't it? Um, what's wrong with that, Jonathan? Anyway. What's wrong with having a celebration? Well, getting people together, hey, yeah, well, that's all right. I don't mind getting people together, but you've got to make it special. Okay. If you have too much of anything, it loses its value. <laughs> Fair enough. So I'll wait till I'm 100. Okay. Yeah, right. Oh, only 40 more years. Mm. We can wait that long. You love your, you love your wine. You write for Wine Selector magazine, I hear. Um, uh, are you the official? Yeah, well, I, I, when I did write for Wine Selector, I don't think I was writing much about wine. Oh, okay. Anything else. Although I do like wine, but I don't... I. Actually went on a holiday last year with um, I did some work for a, a tour company, right? Uh, and they had one of the wine experts, and you think, by golly, there's so much I don't I haven't got a clue about. But these people have a, and they have to drink so much in, in their <laughs> professional lives. You think horrible that can't be good for you. <laughs> yeah, but anyway, do yeah. You, yeah. Do you um do you have a, a bit of a, a collection at home? Do you do you like you know, getting out and uh, trying different wines, and I do, um, mm. but I don't have much of a collection because we don't have much room. Yeah, right. I used to have a, a bit more of a collection, but it seems to have sort of dwindled down. Mm. And my partner, she doesn't drink, um, so uh, it, and, and I try to uh, not drink it <laughs> as much as I used to. Um, mm. But no, I do like I do like um, drinking wine, For the, and I think not just to get you know drunk. Yeah. Oh, I just like the whole culture of it. Yeah, and and this holiday was in in France, and you think, oh wow, it's, yeah. it's such a great you know thing. It is. It I really mean, is. Well, Canberra's got some some uh, some nice wines in our yeah. in our little backyard, so it's um <laughs> have yeah. to become yeah, the official some. wine selector of yeah. the uh, of the Wharf Review cast, mate, and get them around that. Well, yes, I think it's only Philip and I who really sort of you know drink much. Oh, okay. But, yeah. Yeah, and we're surrounded by largely teetotalers. <laughs> You're right. Mm. Well, uh, I'll uh, I'll wish you best of luck with the rest of the uh, the Canberra season. You are in town. Thank you very much. Uh, till the nineteenth, I I can see. Yep. So uh, make sure yep. people get along. There are still tickets available. Uh, fill it up as much as we can in this in this uh, slightly uh, seat restricted time. Yeah, I mean, because you know all the theatre companies have struggled over the year too. So it's nice to be for them to be able to. Get some money in the coffers again. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Mm. Hopefully, um, yeah, it'll be a, a busier year for you in in 2021 when you'll be able to get all those shows back on the road again for you, mate. You must be looking forward Fingers to it. Fingers crossed. Yeah. Fingers crossed. <laughs> Jonathan Biggins, thank you so much for your time, mate. Thanks for joining us. Thank you very much. <laughs>